Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. I'd like to let our television audience know that we tape four programs right in succession, and uh, so for those of us in the studio, it's once a month. But uh, anyway, we like to remind people, because I know they've asked me more than once, and they'll look at you and they'll think, well, those people only have one set of clothes for a whole month. <laughs> but uh, it's just simply because we're taping four programs right in succession. And again, we always like to let the folk in the Tulsa area, eastern Oklahoma, know that if you'd like to come in, be a part of the taping session, give us a call or call the studio. We'd uh, love to have you. We got room for a few more yet, so uh, if you're interested, you come on in. We're just an informal Bible study. We're non-denominational. There's nobody underwriting us. We're not associated with any group. As we started this program, God's people just picked it up and started supporting it, and uh, we have come a lot further than we ever thought we'd be able to come. Remember, too, that all the past programs are available on videotapes, and they are now transcribed into print. And uh, we have a lot of folk that are really getting involved with using the tapes and the books in various ways and various ministries, Sunday school teaching, prisons, and what have you. And, and we're just thankful to the Lord for that. All right, now we're going to get right into the book, because after all, that's what this program is all about, is Bible study. I've always said I'm not a preacher, I'm not an evangelist, but I do feel that the Lord has given me the ability to teach the Word in a way that ordinary people can understand it. In fact, as the lady here was just expressing to me that she had heard from a relative clear out on the West Coast how that this teaching in Romans had just totally opened her eyes to a lot of things she'd never heard before. And so I realized that we're te teaching things that are not normally taught. We're getting a little deeper, and uh, we just feel that this is what the Christian community needs today. We have to get into the doctrines of what God has revealed, and what He's revealed, the Scripture says, He expects us to hang on to it, to believe it, and to trust in it. So we're going to pick right up where we left off at the end of our last program, and uh, that'd be down in the area, uh, verse 10, 11. So let's just uh, go back up to all oh, about verse 5, because I don't like to just jump in on a verse. I like to pick up the flow. And so we'll read from verse 5 and then pick up the, uh, the commenting on it in about verse 10. For they who are after the flesh. Now remember, Paul always writes to the believer. Paul never writes to the unbelieving world. And the reason all these things are being written is so that we have a real, what shall I say, a real reason for living as believers or as Christians. Now, of course, the word Christian has been so mangled and has been so degenerated that I don't like to use it by itself. But if you're a Bible-believing, born-again uh, work of the Spirit of God, then that, of course, is what the name Christian really means. But, of course, not everybody who claims to be a Christian is one. But nevertheless, Paul does write to the believer to enhance our belief, our faith, and to give us roots that, as he says in another place, that will not be tossed about with every wind of doctrine. And, oh, they're coming at us from every direction. Uh, I've stressed it on the program, and I did in my classes here in Oklahoma for several weeks in a row last summer, that when the disciples asked the Lord Jesus, what are the signs of his coming in the end of the age, the first thing he said, do not be deceived. And so we know that the deception, the false teaching that is flooding our, our country is part and parcel of the end time scenario. So these things are written to us who believe, but of course it's also going to have an impact on those who do not as yet believe. And uh, as I stressed to some of my classes this last week, I'm uh, getting more and more of a burden for lost people than I've ever had before because I'm realizing now how many even church people have never had a real salvation experience. All right, so verse 5 now, then again, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now the word flesh here, of course, is another word for the old Adamic nature. And uh, they that are after the Spirit are those who have experienced new birth and are now a child of God. They're going to mind the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, 
For to be carnally, that's another word for fleshly again, for to be fleshly minded is death, spiritual death, eternal doom. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And of course that life is eternal life, that which we will have forever and ever. Verse 7, because the carnal mind, that mind we're born with, that mind that we've inherited from Adam, is enmity against God. And I pointed that out in our last program. Most people don't realize that they're an enemy of God. And after I taped that program, I was reading a footnote in, uh, in some Bible uh, teacher's book of a bygone day. And he was referring to a great revival that had taken place on the campus of Yale University. Now this goes back quite a ways, naturally. And uh, a lot of the students were, were experiencing salvation, and there was really a revival taking place on the campus. And there had been, been this one young lady who was just so benevolent, she would help anybody under any kind of a circumstance. She was just everybody's friend, but as yet she had shown no interest. So some of the girls that had found salvation in the revival were talking to her one day and inviting her to come to the meetings, and uh, she wouldn't respond. And finally, in desperation, one of the girls says, but please come because God loves you. He wants to save you. Whereupon her temper flared and she stamped her pretty little foot and said, I hate God. Well, you see, that's just exactly what I've been talking about. People can keep old Adam under control, but when he's prodded, out it comes, see? And I thought that was the perfect example of what a lot of times we're up against. Oh, they can put on a good veneer. But when they're really confronted with the demands of a loving God, then they show their true colors. I hate God. And they do. They're enemies, see? And uh, that's exactly what this scripture is talking about. So the lost person, whether he realizes it or not, whether he wants to admit it or not, is an <laughs> enemy of God. He's in enmity. And he is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, and we referred to all that in our last program. So then they who are in the flesh or under control of old Adam cannot please God. But, Paul says, you, as believers, you're not in the flesh, see? But you're in the spirit. You're a whole new person. You've been born into the very family of God, as we'll see when we get up to verse 14 and 15. If so be, see, here's the criteria. Here's the proof. Does the Holy Spirit dwell within you? If he doesn't, then you're on pretty thin ice. If he does, you're solid. All right, so if the Spirit of God dwell in you, continuing on in verse 9, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now this is scary, I know it is. And yet I think sometimes people have to be scared a little bit. They have to be shook up and realize that you cannot just take these things in one ear and out the other and dress it up a little bit on Sunday morning for an hour and then hope to spend eternity in the presence of your Creator. It's just not going to happen. And Paul makes several warnings that have scared me over the years, not for myself, but for the sake of people who are living an illusion. In fact, the verse just comes to mind. I didn't intend to use this. Honey, turn over to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Now, we've, we've dealt with this before, I think, on the program. I know I have over and over in my classes here in Oklahoma. But uh, I think sometimes people have to be shook up a little bit. Now, I don't mean get angry. but I mean, they have to be faced with some of these biblical truths because one day they're going to be. You know, Paul says that in the day when Jesus Christ will judge all men, according to what? His gospel. Everybody is going to either stand as lost or saved by what they've done with Paul's gospel. And that is, of course, that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. All right, now have you got Galatians chapter 5? The admonition here is, again, to the Galatian believers, not to fall victim to the legalizers who were making inroads into the congregations that Paul had established in Asia Minor. And so now Paul writes, Stand fast, therefore. See, Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, which, of course, is legalism, the law, Judaism. And then verse 2. 
My, when I first saw this some 15, 20 years ago, it, it just shook me up because I could understand that there are millions of people that this verse is talking to. And what does he say? Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, now he's talking about for salvation, see? If they're going to depend on something that they can do in the flesh for their salvation, then read on. Christ shall profit you how much? Nothing. And the first time I saw that, it did. It just scared me to death. How many millions of good people, church members, who wouldn't dream of missing a Sunday morning service, and yet they're depending on something of the flesh that they have done rather than just rely totally on the finished work of the cross. And this any one thing plus the cross. You cancel it. You cancel the work of the cross. And listen, we've got to warn people. Uh, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not a preacher, and I'm not an evangelist, and I'm not here to, to scare people. But on the other hand, I think we have to realize what the Word says. And it says that if you be circumcised, if you do anything in the energy of the flesh, Christ shall profit you nothing. And then he goes on, and he goes even one step further, and he says, I testify again to every man that is circumcised who has done something. Now, circumcision, of course, was the big deal back then because it was the Jewish people that were bringing this in amongst the Gentile churches. But I've always pointed out, this can be anything that you can do in the energy of the flesh. Joining the church, being baptized, taking the Lord's Supper, good works, as long as you tie it to salvation, you're canceling the work of the cross because God is adamant that he finished it. He did everything that needed to be done. And if we're not satisfied with that, he's not accepting us. And that's why Paul is repeating it. I testify again to every person that is circumcised that then you become a debtor to do the whole law. Now, there's only been one person that has walked this planet that had been able to do that. That was Christ himself. So it's an utter impossibility to keep the whole law. And then he cap puts the cap on it in verse 4. Christ is become of what? No effect. See? Now what does that mean? He can't even touch us as long as we try to do something in the energy of the flesh. He has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law or by legalism, or by doing something that you can do in the energy of the flesh. And then he says, you've fallen from grace. Now, that doesn't mean they've been saved and they fell out. It just means that they have turned their back on that which God has provided. All right, let's come back to Romans chapter 8 quickly. And uh, reading on then, verse 10. And if Christ be in you. Now, I've made a lot of Paul, and I make no apology for it, because Paul claims to be the apostle of the Gentiles. It's within Paul's writings that most of Christendom gets its basic doctrine and everything else, but yet they'll never give him the credit, it seems. And I think I've mentioned on the program that I've had people come up to me over the years who said, well, I've had a Sunday school teacher, or I've had a preacher who just detests Paul's writings, and they can't even see why it's in our Bible. And uh, I'd share with some of my classes, and lo and behold, the other night, a lady in one of my classes here in Oklahoma, she said, Les, I never could quite believe you when you said that people didn't think Paul should be in their Bible. But she said, today, I heard it with my own ears. She said, someone, when I mentioned what Paul had said, how in the world, this lady said, can you believe anything that Paul writes? He shouldn't even be in our Bible. Well, you see, that's probably putting it a little stronger than most, but that's basically the subconscious feeling with a lot of people. Th this guy is so far out, don't pay attention to him, but yet it is foundational to our salvation and to our Christian experience that we realize what this apostle is saying. And so this is a Pauline doctrine, this whole idea of Christ indwelling, especially the Gentile believer. Well, let's look at another one, Ephesians. Maybe someday, if the Lord tarries, we may even teach Ephesians on the air. I haven't decided yet. But uh, go to Ephesians. No, Colossians. I'm sorry, Colossians. Colossians. 
Colossians chapter 4. No, I'm sorry. Chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And drop down to verse 27. Colossians 1, verse 27. And like I said, you won't find statements like this back in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You won't find statements like this back in the Old Testament. You won't find statements like this in any of the rest of the Bible except these epistles of Paul. Now look what he says. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery or this secret among the Gentiles. Now, you know, the fact that God had been dealing with Israel for over 2,000 years before Christ came on the scene, that was one thing. But now that he's dealing with Gentiles, hey, this had never been heard of before. And so he says that this secret among the Gentiles, and this is part of the overall body of truth that we call the mysteries, this particular one is that Christ is in you. See? And that gives us what? The hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right, back to Romans then, chapter 8. <coughs> Reading on in verse 10. So if Christ be in you, the body, that is the, the old Adam again, the body is dead because of sin. In other words, Adam and the flesh were all under the curse. This body is going to die if the Lord doesn't come to translate us. And it's all part of the fall of man, that death came in, and so all men have to die. All right, reading on. But the Spirit, and that's capitalized, so it's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is life. And again, I think Paul is referring to eternal life, that life which will never end because of righteousness. Now verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Now here we have the implication again of the Trinity. God the Father used the power of the Holy Spirit to raise the Son. See how clear that comes out? And so Paul is using all three persons of the Trinity now of which we also become a part. And so if the Holy Spirit of the, the God of the Father raised up Jesus from the dead, if he dwells in you, then that same power that raised Christ from the dead is going to raise us from that position that Adam made us fall into. And so if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Then he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now let's look at another cross-reference, because after all, I think that's where we learn to study the Scripture, is to use more than just one verse at a time. Now flip over to Ephesians chapter 2, and he has almost the same identical language. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, like I said, when I started this series on Romans, I've, I've always noticed over the years it's no problem getting people excited and interested when you teach Genesis, and it's no problem keeping people excited and interested when you teach Revelation. But when you get into Paul's letters and you get into the here and now, where we are today, it's kind of tough getting people interested. But I, I hope we're succeeding because we're getting a lot of response from the program. And uh, like I said, uh, what Alice just said a little bit ago, that uh, she's hearing that people are finally realizing that here is where we have to get our basic doctrines. All right, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, I'm sure most of you know the verse. And you, Paul says, hath he, what? Quickened, made alive, just like the word that's used in Romans 8. And you hath he made alive who were, past tense, what? Dead dead. Now something that's dead is of no use, see? And that's where the whole human race lies so far as God is concerned. They are dead in trespasses and sins, and so were we if we're a believer today. We too were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2, 
Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. We were like everybody else. As a believer, hopefully we're different. But before we became a believer, we were no different. And I've, I've experienced it from so many people. When something will be going on, oh, just the other night, something was going on in one of the cities when we had our Bible class and we had to find our way through the crowd. And the gentleman who was walking with me said, now, you know, a few years ago, he said, I'd been there with a crowd and I wouldn't have even dreamed of going to a Bible study. But now he says it's exactly opposite. I wouldn't dream of being out there with them. He said, I'd rather be here and studying the Word. Well, we've heard that over and over. And this is exactly the way it has to work. That worrying in times past, yes, we all did. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And we were part and parcel of that. And then verse 5, even when we were dead. See how often Paul brings this up? Even when we were dead in sins. Now that's plural. In other words, I've pointed out now since we've been in Romans, the word sin deals with that old Adamic nature, but when it's plural, it's the results of that Adamic nature, see? I always like to use the old whiskey still as an example. The still is one thing, but what it produces is what bends people's minds. You see that? The still is out there. It's the producer, but the still itself doesn't cause people to, to get drunk or have their minds bent and so forth but it's what the still produces. And it's the same way with old Adam. Adam is just like that old still, and it produces sins, plural. All right, so he says, when we were dead in the activity that was prompted by old Adam, he has quickened us. See how he used that word over and over? He has made us alive, how? Together with Christ. And by grace, it's been all accomplished, not by works. All right, let's move on back to Romans chapter 8. And uh, then come down to verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you're going to live after the flesh, you will die. And that, of course, was the first admonition to Adam and Eve in the garden, that the day they ate of, they should surely die. And it hasn't changed. But if you through the Spirit do put to death or mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Yes, the Christian life does involve discipline. But as I've stressed so often, you aren't going to give things up that you just love to do because the things you once loved, you begin to hate and vice versa. And so it's not a matter of giving it up. It's just a matter of having a change of appetites. All right, now in the closing moments of this half hour, I'd like to make comment on these next three or four verses. I'd like to be ready for verse 18 in one of our next programs. And now in verse 14, so he says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they hope to be? No, they are. It's definite. And you see, again, most of Christendom today feels that if you do everything right, if you can hang on, if this and if that, you might make it. But this book never says that. This book says today you are in one of two categories. You are either lost and hell bound or you're saved and heaven bound. It's that simple. Now, I'm, I'm no more narrow than the book because this is what the book declares. There are only two classes of people in the world. You're either in Christ or you're out. There's no halfway in between. And so he says if you're led by the Spirit, then you are the sons of God. In other words, we are born of God. The Greek word is technon, the born ones. All right, then when you come down to verse 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now the word adoption, as Paul used it, does not mean as we do in our uh, culture, take a child that was born to someone else and then legally adopt them into our family. But the word adoption goes back to the Greek and the Roman practice of putting their, especially the eldest son, who is going to get ready and take the, the parents' uh, place in business or whatever, they would take the eldest son and put him under tutors, completely under their control until he reached the age where he was now fully educated, he was fully trained, and he could step right in side by side with the father. 
All right, when that son had reached that age and he was now ready for that position with the father, they went through the rites of what do you suppose? Adoption. And so what the word really means, as Paul uses it, is that we are placed as a full son, not just as one that's born into the family, not as one who has been taken legally from another family, but a son who has gone through the training years, he has been prepared, he's been tutored, and now he is placed as a full partner with the Father. Now, the glory of all this is the moment we're saved, yes, we're now born into the family of God, but immediately what does God do? He also places us as the full heir with Jesus Christ. You don't have to work for 20 years like poor old Jacob had to for his wives. No, we don't have to strive and strain, hoping that we can attain this position moment we believe. And that's why we can say, Abba, Father, as it is here in verse 15. And so get these basic doctrinal truths straight, that yes, at salvation we are born into the family of God by the work of the Holy Spirit, but there comes another act of God that places us then as a full heir. Now let's read on down to verse 17. Only got seconds left. So if we're children, then we're what? heirs, and not just an heir down the line someplace who is going to hope for maybe a little bit of the inheritance, but we're a what? We are a joint heir. Now, even in our own culture, what does a joint heir imply? Equality. What's her, his is hers and vice versa. And so it is as we come in then as being born in the family of God, as being placed equal as a, a full-grown son and we are placed in that position by adoption, we become joint heirs. Boy, don't forget that. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We want to invite you to visit lessfeldick.com, where you'll find all our programs available on audio, video, and in book form. You'll also find many of our on-location teaching seminars held across the country, as well as the popular questions and answers book and many other study materials. Just go to lessfeldick.com. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.